Christ is risen. risen Hallelujah. Dear witnesses of the resurrection, the week that all this COVID madness hit, I was sitting in my office and I got a phone call verifying my address. They told me to be ready because a police officer would be serving me a subpoena for a criminal trial. You see, I am a witness, apparently. Just think about how you might feel getting that phone call. Okay, I love our police officers, but having one come to your door on official business, you know, and well, having to, to go on the stand and answer whatever question they might ask and well, other than whatever would be protected by pastor confidentiality, but I, I don't know that there would really be anything in, in, in this situation for that and not knowing how they're going to use the words and, you know, you see all the stuff on TV with the lawyers. And as much as I love the people involved in the case, as much as I am willing to help and, and want you know, truth and, and wisdom and a good judgment and all of that, can you understand how I might be a little leaky? That, that maybe I'd, I'd rather just kind of stay out of it? Maybe you felt that way. You are witnesses. That's what we hear. But then does that really make sense? You know, because there's something in us that wants to be a witness, right? We want to see stuff. We, 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 we don't want to miss out on something, right? I mean, you, you hear a crash. You can't not go and see what made it, right? I mean, we're, we're the people who, who buy tickets who pay to be able to go and see something that we could just really watch on TV, right? We used to, right? Sporting events or, or concerts or whatever. As much as that is the case, as much as we want to be witnesses, we don't always want to be witnesses. In other words, we don't always want to do what witnesses are expected to do. But whether you like it or not, you are witnesses. That's what Jesus says in our gospel lesson here today. He says it to the disciples who are locked away in there in that upper room for fear of the Jews. <clears throat> he tells them you're, you're of what you witnessed. Witnesses of the resurrection and what they witnessed meant that well, there might be some problems. Because what they witnessed meant that the people with power were wrong. The people with power enough to put Jesus to death were on the wrong side of this, and what they witnessed proved it. They were leading the people astray. Jesus was not a blasphemer worthy of death. He was who he said he was. So what they witnessed meant that those religious leaders were not going to be happy because if they told what they had witnessed, if they did what a witness is supposed to do, well, it meant that those religious leaders had one of two options, either repent or fall under God's judgment. How much do you think those religious leaders are going to want to hear that? But like it or not, Jesus said it to them. You are witnesses. Can you see all the excuses coming? No, 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 Jesus. You, you, don't, you don't want us. Maybe send someone else for, for this. We're not the guys for the job. And, and maybe they had a point, right? I mean, they, the disciples were nobodies. You know, some fishermen, maybe a couple of tradesmen, even a tax collector. Not the credentials you want for your ambassadors, Jesus. And they had already been given a shot, right? They, they messed it up, didn't they? I mean, Jesus, you asked them to pray with you. How hard is that? And what'd they do? They fell asleep. They were there when you were arrested, Jesus. And what'd they do? They fled. 
One of them betrayed you. He, he got you into this whole mess. Another one denied you again and again and again. And even on Easter, Jesus, we heard that they still didn't get it. They weren't expecting you to be alive. They forgot everything you taught them. So now, Jesus, you, you got to get zip recruiter or something. These guys are wrong for this job. <clears throat> Although not more wrong for the job than, than we are. I mean, think about it. Me? A pastor? <laughs> no way. I'm a sinner. I mean, I've, I've done things no one should do. I, I've failed to, to, to be Christ-like in more times than I can count. I'm a disgrace. There's no way I should be a messenger of his grace. And as if my sin-stained record weren't bad enough, Jesus, you want me people to, to follow you? I mean, I, in my career of debates with my wife, I have not won one. No matter how many facts I think I've got, no matter how perfectly I think I lay them out, I have not won a debate once. And you want me to somehow convince other people to follow you, Jesus? No way, you got the wrong guy. Can you relate to that sentiment? Has there ever been a time you haven't been the, the perfect witness for Christ? You kind of backed away from that conversation that, that he had put right there in front of you? Or maybe you, you lived in a way that was not making anyone think, boy, this sounds good. You failed to be Christ's light in the world. You think Jesus is really right about you when he says you are witnesses? And you look at the facts, we've got a point, right? I mean, our, our talents, nothing in that indicates representative of a holy God. There's nothing in me. There's nothing in you. There was nothing in these disciples that would make good witnesses. And there are plenty of reasons, plenty of fears that would make to be good, re good witnesses, plenty of reasons we could point to. But Christ is risen. You knew that was coming. It's Easter Sunday. It has to. Because that truth changes everything. Throughout these Sundays and Easter, we've seen what it means that Christ is risen. You were so good on the first one. We'll try that. Christ is risen. There we go. There we go. So, so last week, each week we're seeing what this risen Savior gives. Last week we saw him give peace. And today actually, I don't know if you noticed it, but it's the same story as we had as our gospel lesson last week. Last week we heard John's account. This week we hear Luke's account. And while they both do talk about that peace Jesus gave, Luke takes us the next step and shares Jesus is also giving us some purpose. Right? He gives us a message to share. He tells us that repentance and faith are to be preached by his witnesses. He sends us with a message of repentance. And we see that in all our lessons, right? In the first lesson, uh, it was Peter and John, and, and they had healed the guy. Everybody comes rushing to them. And what do they do? They preach that message of repentance that Jesus had sent them with. And in John's letter, the, the second reading, John tells us to confess our sins, to turn to Jesus who's on our side. What's that? It's a message of repentance. And so here in our gospel lesson, we see Jesus giving them and us that same message of repentance. And he does that by making them, by making us what he calls us. You are witnesses. And as much as we scream that, no, Jesus, that's a bad idea. You don't want us. He makes us the perfect witnesses by what he gives us. And the rest of the time here, we're just gonna kind of walk through the text and see what he gives us to make us witnesses. He gives us peace. He gives us proof. He gives us passages. He gives us purpose. And he gives us power. So first, peace. We talked about how those disciples had proven themselves absolutely worthless to God. 
how they had failed where they had been set up to succeed, how they had fallen asleep, fled, forgotten everything that Jesus taught them. They had showed themselves completely unworthy of anything good from God. In fact, worthy of his punishment. But instead, God shows up. The Son of God in the flesh, you see it right there in our text, suddenly appears in front of them and look at his message. Peace be with you. Way more than a cat, shalom, how's it going? He gives peace between them and God. That's what his presence does. What those angels had announced as his purpose all those years ago. Remember in the sky, in the fields above Bethlehem? Or in the the sky above the fields around Bethlehem? They said why Jesus came. To bring glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. And now, Christ is risen. His presence there shows it. They had seen him die, paying for sin. They now see that he's done with death. Sin is paid for. Their guilt is gone. They are good God. And Jesus declares it with his words, peace, and he shows it with his presence. He gives peace. It's the peace you have, knowing that your sins are Knowing that Jesus died to pay for them and rose to prove that they're all gone. Knowing that your guilt is gone. Knowing that your future, knowing that as crazy as it sounds, you are good with God because of what he's done. You get to live in that peace between you and God. This risen Savior gives peace. And then you keep going and he gives proof, right? You see the disciples' mind in, in that, that verse there. They're not sure if, if they're seeing a ghost, right? They're, they're kind of scared. What, what's going on? Can they even believe their eyes? Is it really Jesus? And what does Jesus do? Proof. Here, look. My hands, my feet, I am, he says real literally. That's kind of a big one, right? Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I do. And as if that isn't enough, he says, okay, what else can I do? You got some food here? Here, I'll eat some food proving that I'm not a ghost, that I'm really here. There there is nothing else I could imagine that he could do to show themselves, to show him, to show them that he himself is truly there. just like he's given right here in his word. God's word that he has convinced you is true, that he has proven is true. The risen Savior gives proof. Is any shadow of a doubt? Let's keep reading. He gives passages. Look at verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, Jesus is saying, all the Bible is about me. In these passages is all the proof you ever need. I just kept every promise God made. And he goes on. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. The Christ will suffer and rise. He he shows them that the Bible is really clear about that. They're seeing the proof of it right there in front of them. Every promise made in that scripture proven to be fulfilled right there in front of them. And then look at what he says next. What else he showed them? Sure. Repentance and forgiveness will be preached by you. Remember, you are his witnesses. And you have this same tool that he used, scripture. That's what makes you a witness. That's what does and empowers your work of witnessing. And you see what's happening? He's giving you something else. He's giving you purpose, Right? You can use what you've been given to be a witness, to help others, to show them, to tell them, to make God's children. I mean, think about how mind-blowing it is that God should use you to do that, to change people's eternity. 
You have eternally important work, whether you like it or not. But he doesn't send you alone. Look at the last verse. Jesus tells them to wait, to hang tight, because he's got one more gift to give them. Power. Verse 49. I am going to send you what my father has promised, and then skip ahead, clothed, you will be clothed with power from on high. You see, we are not on our own for this witnessing. God had promised the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus reminds them here that he's sending the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Remember, he, he poured out his Spirit on them so that they could be powerful witnesses, and ever since then, he has been pouring out his Spirit on us to do that very same thing. He gives us Holy Spirit to be the power behind our witnessing, the Spirit who works through the Word, the Spirit who changes hearts, the Holy Spirit who does what we never could. But here's the kicker. He uses you to do it. Whether you like it or not, you are witnesses because he has given you the proof, the peace, the passages, the purpose and the power, and now he gives you opportunity to be those witnesses. <clears throat> now I know in the midst of all this shelter at home stuff, it might seem that our opportunities for that are limited, but, but I don't think so. I mean, it's true, we were not able to all work together to put on Easter for kids and bring 100 kids on campus and tell them the message of Easter and share it with their parents and invite the parents to come back. There wasn't a single unchurched family that was here hunting for Easter eggs on Easter Sunday, and, and no one on Easter Sunday signed up for Bible information class, which is usually what we use, that whole thing. We, we encourage people, we, we, we share the good news of Jesus, you know, we, we get them here by, by promising Easter eggs, and, and, and then they get to hear the, the wonderful thing that Jesus rose from the dead and what that means for their lives, and then we say, don't you want to grow in that, and, and, and get them to sign up for Bible information class where they commit to, to being in God's word, and you see, it just works, right? But this year, none of that happened. But probably better. Why? You are witnesses. I guarantee you that every one of you knows someone who could use Bible information class, who could use some time to get their questions about God's word answered, who, who could use some growing in their relationship with God, who could maybe even use a relationship with God. So invite them. I mean, what else are they going to do? We can do it on Zoom. The, our, our, our subscription gives us up to 450 people, screens on there. So, so if we fill that, we'll get another subscription. But, but there's plenty of opportunity. You know someone. Invite them. Encourage them to come along with you. You can do it from the comfort of your own home and grow in your relationship with God. That's an opportunity. And there are many more, even easier ones. I mean, think about it. I'm guessing you've been in contact with people over the past few weeks. Maybe not much physical face-to-face -face contact, but you've been in contact. You've been texting or IMing or, or, or Facebook messaging or, or Snapchatting or whatever. You've been in contact. Do you know how easy it is with that phone or computer or device, whatever you're using, how easy it is to share a link to a YouTube video of our services. Yeah, just imagine the conversation. Hey, what'd you do this week? How easy is it to answer, I heard a fantastic sermon. Well, pick whatever adjective you want. But I, I heard a sermon about what Easter means for my life, how it changes my life. You should hear it. Here it is. Click, boom, you're a witness. And actually this week, Vicar, Vicar went and took all of those that are still on, all the full services that are still on YouTube and, and, and cut them down to just the sermons and put them in a file on uh, docs.abidinggrace.com. So you can take one of those, you can share those as well. Real easy. With one little click, suddenly you're a witness and you've just shared the, the peace and the proof and the passages and the purpose and the power. And God uses that. God uses you, his witnesses. I mean, 
right now there are people watching online that haven't been in church in a while. But they're hearing it all. And the Holy Spirit's working. I cannot wait for the day when, when we can have the, the full gathering together again. It is going to be awesome. I'm really excited to see all the people that God's been working through that, that we don't get to see right now. And I pray it's you. Because you are witnesses. Because you have the, the peace and the proof and the passages and the purpose and the power. Because Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.